uh, who is um, just OE Global, in case you haven't met him, and he's the technical help. Um, and yes, so my name's Glenda Cox. I work at the University of Cape Town um, in a center for innovation in learning and teaching. I do um, quite a bit of formal teaching on postgraduate courses and master's courses in learning theories, uh, course design, curriculum design, uh, learning technology. So that's kind of my, my core uh, role and obviously supervise students. But my real passion is open education and I've been in open education since around 2010. Um, and did a PhD through GoGN, um, focusing on OER contribution and non-contribution of lecturers. So, and finding a theoretical frame for that. So that was my PhD work, which finished in 2016. I have been involved in various international projects. Uh, probably the biggest one was the research for open education resources for development or raw for d which was based at UCT, which was a, a 21 countrywide uh, global South study. Um, and I did a component, the South African component of that. So that was a, an incredible network to be part of. Um, and members of that network are continuing their good work today. And currently I am the lead in the digital open textbooks for development project, which is based at the University of Cape Town, we've been um, doing implementation work with lecturers to create open textbooks. We've done quite a bit of research. Um, all our research is framed um, using Nancy Fraser's social justice. So we've been looking at open textbooks and their role in social justice. And that work's kind of tailing off at the moment. Um, and we're hoping to continue that work next year, getting, hopefully getting some funding from somewhere. Um, because we want to grow a national network in South Africa of open textbooks and eventually, hopefully, broaden out to a kind of open textbooks in Africa. Uh, so that's, that's my passion and interest. So that's enough about me. Um, very excited to be chairing this session today. The conference has gone, I think, exceptionally well so far. I've been part of some sessions. It's very difficult when it's virtual, I'm sure, for everyone. So we're all trying to do our normal jobs and conference at the same time. Um, it's not like going off to some fabulous venue and for being you know, intensively involved for three, four days. Um, but still, I, I feel it's been, uh, the sessions I've been to have been really useful. So we have five presentations today. I think you're probably used to the format. Um, everybody has around 20 minutes to present. And then there is nice built-in time at the end for a, a kind of general discussion if, if people haven't kind of managed to get in their questions in between. Um, obviously ask questions in the chat as you go along. And what I've found in previous sessions is people share very useful links in the chat. Um, and you can actually copy the chat for yourself. You'll see the three little, uh, the little ellipse that's there. If you click on that, it actually says save chat. But I'm... Um, Jan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that all the presentations and the chat will be saved into this webinar. Um, so if you need to come back to it later, um, you can come back. Um, because often it's sort of, oh, that's such a nice link. I need to copy that, but we're going to, you can actually do that at the end of the session. So uh, we've got five presentations today. Um, uh, starting off with Building Open Education Global Francophone. Um, that will be presented, a combination presentation by, and um, uh, I don't speak French, Karine <laughs> Kutlogo, um, yes. and then we will move on to, um, and they are from the University of Lille in France. Then we'll move on to solving challenges of sustainability of community engagement for OER, um, which is Julianne Granley and um, Orna Farrell. Then developing and implementing an OER to foster critical data literacy in higher education educators, an international cooperation program. Um, I think that will be uh, led by Leo Haverman, but also 
with contributions from Caroline Kuhn and Xavier Atenes. Uh, then we will have Rob Farrow talking about um, enhancing research communities through open collaboration, the GoGN Guide to Conceptual Frameworks, um, and then finally, a presentation on the European OER ecosystem, state of play across tech, policy, quality, and business innovation, led by um, Ulf Daniel, who is here. Welcome, Ulf. I didn't see you earlier. Um, and I think co-presented co by Julia. Okay, so I'm not going to say anything more now. I want to hand over to the first presenters, to Perrine. Um, to talk about, and Ramel, to talk about uh, their Francophone initiative. So over to you, Ramel, I think you are sharing your screen. Thank yes. you very much, Linda, for this introduction. Um, I am uh, very happy to be with you and uh, work on working on international cooperation uh, for to, to support uh, the UNESCO recommendation is really interesting. When I was uh, elected as a member of the board of Open Education Global, we were in the lockdown <laughs> and I, I, we, we saw slowly that the, the, the next conference in Taipei could not happen as, as uh, it was planned. So I, I thought of taking this opportunity of going online to finally, you know, uh, take all the contacts I could have, have done in the past years and try to create a new francophone network with all the people already working on OER and speaking French. Of course, they can speak other language. It's like English. You are not all <laughs> from uh, English speaking countries. And uh, this is the same with French. A lot of people speak French. Uh, not only in Europe, of course, but also in Africa and in Canada and in many other parts of the world. So my next question was how to do this? <laughs> how, I am a lot on social networks, but how to use them more properly to find my community? Of course, you have the existing networks. Jacques is one of the very active uh, person, uh, Jacques, who is there as a participant today. Uh, very active people, they all have uh, all the networks, but we wanted to address other people so that all the people we knew uh, in the Francophone community would be the speaker and we will find a new public <laughs> for uh, interested by open educational resources. So that it's not only a question of building a, a network of existing people, but also addressing new people. And uh, I am not a communication specialist. I am not very organized. So I, I was so happy to meet Romuald. Romuald is here with us. And uh, I, I met him thanks to LinkedIn because he liked a post I also liked. And I discovered that he, he could do anything for me. <laughs> he could build a website. He, could, he knew what a conference was, an online conference. He knew the tools. And he's a specialist of web marketing and communication. So I, I, we, we did that together from August to November last year, 2020. We build up a community and now we have a mailing list, an amazing mailing list, and we organize a webinar once a year, uh, once a month, every last Thursday of each month. <laughs> and uh, we are very happy to have done that because if, for example, Colin de la Guerra, who is uh, in, at the University of Nantes organizing this event and next month, next May too, uh, the, the Open Education Global has to show something, he's able to have a, a mailing list of uh, more than 800 contacts, francophone contacts. So this is really interesting, a uh, very interesting tool. So to come back to the conference, the idea was to find a motivated people that we knew and to ask them what they would like to present. We had very various thematics, like uh, 
political francophone panel where you had people from Canada, Tunisia, Switzerland, Egypt, <laughs> uh, Bulgaria that met for the first time, seven people, seven women actually. And you had um, also uh, the European context of who we are, what is done on, on French, actually teaching French. Or you had uh, lawyers, but from university, who said where we were uh, in France, uh, French uh, law, uh, to know where we were in intellectual property French law, uh, on creative commons or not using creative commons and how, how it was. And we had 21 different webinars on all the thematics with people, speakers coming from uh, Ivory Coast, uh, Senegal, uh, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, and uh, Congo Brazzaville. Uh, as I told you, uh, many countries were represented uh, and a lot of people came too during those two days on the 12th and 13th of November 2020. So I was very happy to have this opportunity to speak to the English speaking people today <laughs> and tell them about the way we did it and uh, where it gets uh, professional. I will give the uh, about uh, numbers. I will give the, the, the floor to Romuald, who will tell you more about the results. Uh, and then I will, I will end up with just telling you about other deliverables where you have no numbers, but that are fantastic achievements of building this Francophone community. And I want to tell you that I am also uh, very involved in the, in the blockchain uh, community and even for my government. So I will have to, to leave. Uh, I'm very sorry for that. <clears throat> and uh, if you have other questions, you can find me on many social networks and I will give you my, my mailing address should you have other questions. So please, Romuald. Hi, um, so I'm Romuald. I'm specialist of marketing and communication. So I help uh, Perrin and the University of Lille to build a marketing strategy uh, to achieve uh, the goal uh, we fixed together. Um, uh, the challenge, uh, like Perrin says, is to build a new community uh, around uh, teacher and uh, We can't hear you, Ronald. It's lost your sound. You. Yeah, no. and also you're not sharing your screen, just to let you know, nothing is happening in our side. It just says started sharing. It hasn't, you need to just click on share, I think. But it says double click to enter full screen mode. Something is, yeah. Probably is bandwidth. So just to begin with- uh, We can't hear you, Rumo. Can you hear me? Yeah, we yes. can hear you. All right. So I'm just uh, waiting for Romuald and seeing what's happening. <coughs> we, we made a, a check before, so it's very strange. Can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, again. Yes, okay. Now. yes. It's and the chest. You. Okay. You, you, you can, can you hear me right now? Yeah. Yes, but it's not great. It's not as clear as you were when okay. you started talking. It's a little bit breaking up. Okay. Is it is better than? Yeah. Um, yes, better than. Okay. It is. I, I don't know. Maybe it's my material. Okay, Sorry. Then. Sorry yeah. for that. And can you don't see move, my no, screen? Don't, move. don't do anything. <laughs> yeah, I don't teach anything anymore. Can you see? <laughs> no, can you can you see my screen? No. 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 <laughs> Oh no. my God, uh, choo, choo, choo. then you can see my screen. No, but we, uh, we only see a black thing, no. Ronald. We see something that says double click to. So oh, I think, think in the bottom can... right hand corner, there's something that actually says share. I think you're halfway through sharing, but not you complete. Can tell me I am, I am in course sharing in, um, you know, I have the 
someone should display his presentation or the right. Uh, uh, maybe Perrin, you can share my my screen. Mm. If you if you send me uh, the presentation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So sorry for that. So I will send you in the chat right here. You have it in the uh, yes. Yeah. So is a document. Yeah. So you can oh. share it, Glenda. That's great. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. 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 Every, everyone, don't worry. Don't that. panic. <laughs> don't panic. So, don't no, panic. sorry for that. No, the worry that happens always. Happens. Please don't worry. So, always. so you have you, so you have the the piece. Yes. And you can go to page uh, page five. Is about uh, persona or profiles. Yep. It's good. It's good for everyone. I don't know why. I... Uh, maybe Jan, you could uh, you could take off the the sharing of the screen. No, because I see the, the option is one participant can share uh, at the time in the Zoom uh, settings. Maybe you can uh, uh, change that. Is that good? Sir? Yeah, yeah, it's my, good. It's my, uh, okay. It's, okay, so you can go to, thank you. Perry. Yeah, five, page five. Thank you, sorry. So, um, to uh, summarize, um, to uh, achieve the, the goal to build uh, our new community, I, uh, I use a, a, a marketing technique called Persona. It's, uh, it's uh, just um, an, uh, uh, building and a profile of uh, best target uh, of uh, attendee. So uh, I um, talk with Perrin and uh, other uh, speaker to try to define the best profiles of um, attendees. So uh, Perrin, if you scroll down, a little bit. So um, I uh, make, uh, I think, uh, four or five uh, persona uh, representing uh, the most common uh, profiles of attendee for um, educational uh, um, conference. So with this, uh, I can determine uh, what's the, what contact of this person, uh, did, they use, uh, did, did they use email, uh, social network to reach them. And with that, uh, Perrin, you can go, uh, in um, what I will show you another link. Sorry for that. Uh, right here. Okay. Oh, in the chat again. You have it, maybe. You can see it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see people uh, in the document. Yeah, it's good. So, <laughs> sorry, is is a number. You have uh, two uh, two parts. So um, we have um, uh, the the number of, of the conference. So uh, as you can see, we, we you success to convert uh, the, the the persona in real uh, participants. So uh, we get uh, for two days uh, um, in um, in the conference. Yes, yeah. Vas-y, vas-y, continue. Yes, yeah. you get uh, six um, six hundred and forty seven unique registrants. Uh, for 21 events, uh, and we uh, the people came uh, from 39 different countries. Uh, that, that's uh, that um, the, the result of the two days of conference in uh, in France, uh, francophone uh, conference. And after uh, we uh, succeed uh, this event, uh, we try to. Um, to further uh, the success and uh, we build um, uh, um, a conference program uh, webinar uh, every month uh, with a new and old speaker 
um, to um, complete uh, the best um, what the world the best subject. Uh, for instance, when we do the two days of conference uh, with the analytic and statistic, uh, we can see that some subjects uh, were more um, popular. And uh, we, we use uh, this element to build uh, the next uh, event every month uh, to be sure uh, to have uh, the good conference for good the good uh, audience. Uh, I don't know if I'm very clear. Uh, well, yes. Perrine, you yes, say? You are Romald. Yes, thank you. Yeah. You're very clear. So, okay. And after the second part, I, I want to share with you, uh, Perrine, you can go in your uh, LinkedIn profiles. Yep. Uh, by the way, I just take this opportunity to say that uh, we were allowed by Open Education Global to create Open Education Global Francophone and use yep. the same logo. Yes, yes. Uh, this was uh, sub submitted to the board uh, in September 2020. So you want to go to my profile? Yeah, to your profile. I retry every time to share my own screen, but uh, it doesn't work. I don't know why. I'm going now. Uh, you you see my screen or not? Not now. Uh, not not now. now. Okay, I'm sharing it now. Up. There is one step missing, Terine. Yeah. Yes, okay. now we can see it. Yeah, okay. so uh, Perrine, you can go down uh, in your profiles and stop your app here to link uh, the results. Yes. Yes. So you see it, right? yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, and you can go uh, down a little bit. So uh, what, what we did is uh, to build uh, um, different uh, audience uh, sources from mailing lists, social networks, uh, mostly LinkedIn, because uh, it's very uh, using tool to build a professional community and the research one with a university college um, as a speaker. So uh, what we did is build a prospect list in LinkedIn and community uh, list uh, in um, Facebook. Uh, I can show you because we have uh, not a lot of time, but the strategy was to, in, link, in uh, Facebook, we, I search a target some communities. So for instance, after uh, um, uh, um, listing the French speaker in the world, I try to find some community group in Facebook. For instance, I contact a lot of Tunisian uh, um, uh, residents uh, because a lot of them speak French and love, love, I found a lot of them are really interested in open education uh, and, and so. And I build community in uh, Facebook like this and I use LinkedIn more to search uh, very specific profiles um, by uh, university in the world uh, using uh, speaking French and uh, also involved uh, in um, open education stuff, creative common stuff. So like Perrin says, we have a lot, lot of different uh, country and background that was very interesting to meet uh, people from uh, uh, Cote, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. I don't know in English Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, I very close. Yeah, very <laughs> close. And um, uh, Canada, Switzerland, uh, even China, uh, Latin America. So we, we target the five continents. And with LinkedIn, the good, uh, the good stuff is uh, you, we can uh, have, um, uh, what, what's, uh, what's English for? Um, uh, we can mix several communities of professional uh, uh, educational, educational. So that was in the big lines of strategy. And now uh, we have um, built a little uh, YouTube channel uh, that I, um, I used to uh, re recast and uh, broadcast the past events and the, um, the, the objective uh, in uh, mid-term, long-term is to uh, enrich uh, the, our community, but we want now build um, 
language um, uh, program is uh, we want to uh, it help me a little bit to try to explain uh, the, the next step. Correct um, uh, me if I'm wrong. The next step will be to um, uh, reunite French speaker, but uh, they have also other language. Uh, for instance, uh, people speak French and Spanish, French and uh, whatever, to uh, make uh, some um, uh, asset resources. Uh, uh, with French at uh, at uh, half, but with uh, uh, other uh, speaker speak language to build um, networking uh, exchange uh, of resources uh, like this. I don't know if I, I was very clear. Um, yes, I think you are. Just to, to th so thank you very much. Um, you see, we came from nowhere, but no. There were already existing networks. A lot of people are convinced of open education in the francophone world, but it was always hard to meet all together. And of course, online events is interesting. Um, <clears throat> it's true that uh, a lot of enthusiasm came and you know, the, the, the people who build the community, they are not uh, 600, so they are maybe 50. And this is enough to make a lot. So we will. Uh, we we. I was very supportive, of course, when I saw that Nantes was a, the University of Nantes was a candidate to organize Open Education Global. Uh, it couldn't happen this week. I am quite happy personally because I, I just moved home this week, so I couldn't attend a lot of sessions, and it was really a very difficult week for me. But in May, you can count of francophone people to come to Nantes. It will be very interesting from every continent. And uh, Romuald had also a, a fantastic idea to build a hackathon, a translation hackathon, to, to make people meet from other languages and have a, a common base of some OER, you know, so we'll choose. I wanted to finish up, uh, I have one minute to tell you that there was a lot of uh, initiative due to this one uh, that uh, followed. For example, uh, in the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa, uh, they, they decided to, to give themselves uh, an objective of 100 OER in, in, uh, in 100 days uh, this year. And uh, the, it was a big success. It was uh, uh, created by uh, Lilia Shinetti in the University of Sousse in Tunisia and Gada El Kayat from the University of Alexandria in Egypt. And it was uh, from the beginning three lingual. So French, English, and Arabic. Oh yeah, so super interesting. Uh, the, mini the French Ministry of National Education had the general state of uh, digitization of education after the lockdown because there were so many complaints that they wanted to, to have a special moment for that last year. And it ended up in a, a recommendation, uh, an action plan of uh, 42, uh, 42 points. And one of them is about uh, open softwares and open educational resources. And I was told that it was thanks to this event uh, open Education Global Francophone, that OER were represented in this action plan. So you see, it's uh, the kind of, of thing that has uh, been uh, great. And also uh, Barbara Klaas from the University of Geneva, she, she launched uh, a new Open, educa uh, open Education uh, Review and many other things happened, but now it's already 10.31. <laughs> and uh, I am really happy to have been able to tell you what it was about because I know it's not easy <laughs> uh, to, to make people aware of such a great initiative. And I hope uh, that we will all meet uh, next, next um, May in Nantes, in France. Open Education Global, global <laughs> not francophone will be uh, organized for the first time in a francophone country. So it's great. And I'm looking forward to this event. 
have a good day. Very, very sorry to have to go to this policy meeting on blockchain. We'll uh, meet next year, hopefully. Goodbye. Me, I was still here. It's just uh, like I have a baby, so <laughs> if uh, sometime I go, I will be okay. going back uh, for, <laughs> with you. Okay. Thank you very much for the fascinating presentation. Thank you from both of you. Um, and yes, sorry that you have to leave now, Naveen, um, if there were any questions. Um, we will. I, have to I can ask some 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 of uh, <laughs> question because uh, I know I know the project. So I can ask uh, if people have uh, some question. I can answer to answer to them. I think the only the only question that came up we can deal with it quickly is um, well it's more of a comment comment from uh, Florence. Yeah. Florence. I see two. Yeah, I see two of who, them. Yeah. Who spoke about the personas um, all being. Uh, PhD, PhD. yeah, I, I That's see that. something you did specifically. Yeah, but, um, uh, to be uh, quick and simple, is not um, we we have to make some choice, and uh, the the the, I, the the idea in the beginning is uh, to do all uh, French level education. Uh, this was very ambitious, uh, ambitious, uh, but uh, we will we work with uh, University of Lille and the um, uh, the help and uh, the support uh, came uh, with this kind of condition because we, 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 we are not able to do everything. But the, the project uh, at, the, at the beginning is to do every level of education and the speaker. Uh, this was just um, a condition for organize this event to have uh, what's in English for to uh, search her uh, teacher such a status, uh, you know, people, uh, they are teach and research. Uh, it was a condition because we, we build a scientist committee. So you need to have a PhD speaker, you know, but this was a, a restraint, so kind of. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Okay, we're going to move on to our next um, session, which is solving challenges of sustainability of community engagement for OER, um, presented by Julianne Granley, who's from the International Council of Open Distance Education, um, combined with Orna Farrell, I'm not sure who's leading, Orna is from the University College Dublin, Ireland, and she presented the um, resource called Go Open, which you must um, all have a look at. Great introductory resource. Uh, Thanks, Glenda. That was, but <laughs> thank you for that presentation, Orna. It was particularly useful. But yes, thank you. Um, do you like to go ahead, the two of you? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to start, I think. I think, but you, Julianne, you're, you're sharing screen, are you? Yep. Cool. So great to be here. Lots of familiar phrases from previous OE Global presentations and uh, and conferences. Um, pity we're not in France, but anyway. Um, so today we're going to talk about the, the role of community in the Encore Plus project. Um, so if you don't, if you haven't heard of Encore Plus, you're going to hear a lot about it in this session. Yes. <laughs> um, so prepare yourself. Um, so Encore is an EU funded project, uh, which essentially is trying to create community around open educational resources and by creating a big community or an ecosystem um, try and uh, bring OER into the mainstream. So one thing that we're doing in this project which I think is quite different is trying to engage those in the business community as well as education. So we're trying to look outside the bubble and bring different stakeholders in. So three years, nine partners, you can see it's a big project there with lots of different partners uh, and several several other part, partner members are here. Rob is there. Ulf, I think, possibly is around there somewhere. There he is, Ulf. Uh, Julianne, you've met. Um, Katarina, I think, is there too. So there's loads of us. Um, big European consortium. So if you'd want to advance the slide, Julianne. Ah, okay, so I've kind of mentioned some of this already. So our, our approach to creating uh, the community to catalyze open educational resources uh, is community building. So we've got these communities we call circles. 
it's at very early stages. We had our first circle events this week, uh, two, uh, one on Monday and one on Thursday. So the innovation one met on Monday, led by Rob, and the policy one met yesterday, uh, led by myself. Um, and the idea we, is we'll have four circles around different themes. So you, you, we have, as I said, policy, innovation, uh, with technology, and what is the fourth? Quality. Quality, that's it, Ulf's one. Uh, yeah. So we'll have these circles, we'll have many events, and the idea is to keep broadening the, the circle of people involved, more and more stakeholders uh, through every event. And really we're, we're looking to co-create resources, um, guidelines to support further proliferation of OER. We'll also act as kind of a hub for innovation. So we'll show, show examples of good, uh, in my case, OER policy, uh, and, and hopefully through showing these examples and sharing, sharing knowledge that we will proliferate further uh, and create a wonderful ecosystem. So next slide, please. I think I've said all of that. So you can next slide again. And I think this is you, Julianne. Yeah. So we wanted to spend a few minutes of the presentation, um, including what Orna just said, to give the backdrop of the community need that we've identified. So we could start with where it all started. Uh, the project is centered around five challenges. And the first one is fragmentation of the OER stakeholder communities in Europe, lack of collaboration and interoperability among European OER repositories, low development OER institutional strategies in European business and academia, lack of an integrated European OER quality paradigm and quality assurance mechanism, and a lack of entrepreneurial innovative approaches and business model based on OER. So these are the five challenges that was identified by the project team that we were looking to solve. And so when we were looking at how to solve this or what is the solution, uh, the Encore ecosystem model came out of it. The model, as you see it here, in the outer orbit are the five challenges, in short, that I just told you about. We're looking to solve them through a community of four thematic circles, as Orna mentioned, which all comes together as a European catalyst network or an ecosystem, as we would like to call it. Throughout the project, we are uh, hoping or planning to engage with about one, two, two, four uh, organizations or actors or individuals. So we don't know yet if it's a hairy goal or not. We will see. Uh, we're early. 16 circle events. So that's four uh, main events per theme. And then we will have three integration events where we, we focus on cross-cutting challenges between the four themes. What we're here today to talk about really is what we've learned so far. And as Orna mentioned, we've had two events, uh, which means we are still in the early phases. But we wanted to talk a little bit about our experiences from those two circles that we've had. We've had innovation on Monday and poli uh, policy yesterday. So these are just some thoughts that we were uh, we've had that OER experts and enthusiasts, they're quite keen on projects like this, and they, they would be happy to join a community. What we're maybe struggling with is to get those that aren't already uh, in the OER uh, enthusiast group. Time is your friend really is, it takes a while to build a community. We need clear objectives for engagement. There's so much going on that we need to be quite clear with those that are engaging with the project, what is expected of them. You also see that we, uh, ex in our experience, active participation is important, co-creation. And that we, um, besides active participation, allows that engagement to be on different levels. We can't, uh, we, we also noticed, and I think this week is a good example, there's high competition for people's attention and time. Uh, and it's- Ske Scheduling only... it against a major conference was possibly not the best plan, but anyway, that's the way it happened. <laughs> we live and we learn, um, but also 
uh, we know that the fall, for instance, in this sector is, um, there's a lot going on. And I think Ulf, who is here, he will get into this a bit later, but altruistic motives for engaging with the OER is simply not enough. Yeah, we need to be thinking about what problems are we actually trying to solve from that point yeah. of view. Yeah. We wanted to give you some uh, thoughts from our own experiences, so I'll give you uh, a brief from ICD's network. ICD is a membership organization. Uh, we are global. We have a number of different committees and special interest groups. You could call them communities. We have the OER Advocacy uh, Committee. I think Ebba, who is chair of that, is here in the meeting. Quality Network. What's special about all of these working groups or networks or committees in ICD is that they're all voluntary, which means that they need to be actively engaged, but they also have to want to, right? We've seen from ICD that when we are working in networks, the global diversity that we bring broadens our perspective. It gives a number of personal connection and networking opportunities as sparks collaborative opportunities uh, globally and then it increases impact it means we can join forces we can share have global advocacy campaigns we can uh, focus on thought leadership and we learn through sharing of expertise and practice i give it back to orna yeah the jazzy slide is mine all right um mm -hmm. so i suppose yeah we were we were I suppose we're we're learning about how to create these communities, and as as Julianne said, we're looking to our own previous experiences and communities we've been involved in to try and learn lessons from that, because the goal of growing four four quite large communities, uh, it's it's quite challenging to be honest. So you know we're we're you know community is not a new concept in education. You know you've got the COI model, you've got Wenger's work around communities of practice. So we're very much drawing on those kind of um, concepts. And really, it, you know, in terms of open education and community, those concepts align very nicely. You know, you, you're coming from that kind of either connectivist or social constructivist point of view. Um, and the OER community is already very vibrant, but how to get outside that bubble and grow a bigger community is, is, is the, the question we're facing. Um, do you want to advance the slide, Julianne? Thank you. So from our from my experience, Julianne shared some of the ICD experience that I'm, I'm involved in a number of different communities, but two that I, I've chosen just to just to explore a little bit, share share these kind of characteristics. Um, so they have a clear purpose. Everyone shares something that, that we're all interested in. Um, people people come along to community events because they like talking to each other. So there's kind of a connection. Um, so having some events is important, whether they be online or in person, and um, they're often very practical. And one thing that we found that really cemented our connections in the two communities I'll speak about is having projects or shared shared goals. So whether it be creating an open resource, co-creation is often part of that, or, for example, collaborating on a special issue of a journal. It doesn't really matter what the project is, as long as there's um, a clear project that brings people together. The, the last point on that is um, funding seems to play a role for us because we, we get these pockets of small seed funding and you get about a thousand euro uh, from our national body, the National Forum, to host a seminar. Uh, and that's been very useful because it's been it's been easy funding to secure, but it also it, it puts dates in the diary. Um, so, you know, it's forced to say, you know, you know if we want to do, get this funding, we'll, we'll hold the event. Um, so that's good, too. And, and the last point on that is champions. Uh, you, need, you seem to need a core group of enthusiasts at the centre of a community. And then those around, around them may be less enthusiastic or have less time, but you do seem to need a good core team that will drive, drive the community on. So next slide, please. So one community I'm, inv I'm involved in and have been involved in from the start is called ePortfolio Ireland. It's about five years old. It started as a very small uh, institutional user group uh, around Mahara, and now it's grown to an, a national organization. 
it started very informally and organic in a very organic way. You know, somebody just said, oh, I'm interested in that. Can I come along? Uh, and that's kind of how it went. Um, and now we have representatives from most of the universities in Ireland. You don't have to pay a subscription or anything to be involved. You just come along. And I, th I think that openness has really helped it grow as well. We were mainly HE people. But now there's all sorts of further education, secondary education, whoever wants to come. Um, one thing that's really kept the community going is Twitter. We do a lot of things on Twitter and we've had some great projects as well. We co-created an ebook around portfolio assessment. At the moment, we're working on a special issue of a journal. So those projects I, I feel have been key. So next one, Julianne. And the other one I just wanted to, to call out was the Open Teach uh, community. So Open Teach was a funded project around teaching online. Um, it, it, it's been around for about three years now. Twitter formed a huge part of this community. The sense of purpose was, was learning about teaching online and it coincided with the pandemic. So you can imagine how that went. It was very popular. But um, it, it, we had a, a short online course or a MOOC. Um, again, open to everyone. So that, that kind of catalyzed the community. But after that, we co-created uh, an open textbook and included um, participants' uh, activity ideas. So again, that idea of having um, a shared purpose, but also co-creation of resource, I think is really important. So those are the kind of examples that I hope we'll learn from for Encore. Um, um, Julian, do you want to go to the next one? I think this is your one. Yep. Yeah. So uh, back to the original uh, title of our, our presentation today, looking at the sustainability of this um, community engagement or the challenges that we're seeing. Um, one of the first and biggest uh, challenges we're seeing is attention. There is everyone that's involved in the OER seems to be uh, in, involved in more than one thing. Yeah. Uh, for Encore specifically, uh, Encore is such a wide project that uh, it can seem abstract. So we need to focus on that. Coordination, uh, this relates to uh, some of the earlier points with uh, anyone that goes into that community, they're not yet in a team or they're not on a payroll. So there's a lot of coordination that goes into it. But then I think the, perhaps the most prevalent challenge that we're seeing is the echo chamber. And uh, I'm sure this room is no different uh, or probably not too different, that the OER enthusiasts are easier to catch than those outside. Uh, Encore is meant to be a, a project also that bridges the business and academia. And uh, it's just something that we realize that we keep need having to work on and uh, finding ways to engage those that aren't already in the sector. So we, yeah, the LinkedIn group, I hope we formed a LinkedIn group, which we think that's where business people hang out. <laughs> uh, so, so in order to try, try and uh, get some people. So breaking outside the echo chamber, as it says on the slide there, I think that's going to be really challenging. Because when you work in education, you know other people in education, you know, it's hard to find those wider. So if anyone here has friends in business who like, who sound like they are interested in open, please, please put them in touch with us. Absolutely. I'll share the links to all our LinkedIn groups. So we formed four LinkedIn groups, one for each theme uh, to start, hoping to engage also asynchronously in the event. Wanted to briefly show you, um, go straight here. We've already completed the two first uh, circle events this week. In the next month, we are having the quality and OER technology circle, hoping to see as many as possible there. And uh, to, uh, like when I said, bring them along, bring anyone along that is outside of our uh, echo chamber. And yeah, we will, I'll share some links to you right now. You know, there are four uh, LinkedIn groups. We also have from the two first circles, two position papers, one from um, uh, created by Orna and one from Rob uh, on innovation and policy. They're all open for feedback, uh, which means you can all go in and kind of join the community in that way. 
And then we invite you to come to a circle event. Anything to add to that, Orna? No, that's it. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, here is the project details if you'd like to find out more. And I think Juliana is going to throw some links in the chat now. Thank you. Thank you very much to both presenters. Yes, we've got links coming into the, the chat area. Um, fascinating, really interesting for me. I think I've learned a lot from this. In, in the interest of time, I kind of feel I should be maybe moving along um, because we're slightly over and I don't want to get into the situation where we, you know, don't get everyone a full chance. And then at the end, we can kind of make some, some summarizing com comments and maybe ask a few questions. Um, but thank you very much to both of you for an excellent presentation. Um, okay, then I need to add, um, hand over to a, a combined presentation, um, developing and implementing a, an OER to foster critical data literacy in higher education educators. Um, and this is a combination of, I think, presenting will be Leo, Caroline, and Javier. I think Leo is kind of leading the show. Over to you. Our DJ. The DJ. Great, we can okay, see Okay, can you see the screen? Yep. Yes, perfect. Yeah, right. right. I'm really just DJing. I'm like the glamorous assistant of this presentation. And it's, no, I don't it's agree. Mostly, I don't agree. Um, <laughs> it's mostly <laughs> going to be uh, Caroline and Javier doing the doing the work. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much. Caroline, did you want to um, introduce the um, Yes, thank you. So yeah, this is a, a joint uh, work, really. We have done um, a, a good, I would say, group work. And the idea of the project is develop and implement an open educational resource that foster critical data literacy. And I think the critical aspect of the data literacy is really what we focused on. And it's an international cooperation program. Um, so we worked, yes, yeah, so we worked Leo, Javiera, me, uh, Carolina Vega, Virginia and Manuel, and particularly um, Virginia, Manuel and, and Carolina Vega were key <clears throat> people in our Uruguayan um, version, really key people. <clears throat> so yeah, the next slide, Leo. Uh, okay, so uh, one of the, the things that we wanted to mention is that this project is quite an interesting um, case study in relation to various different aspects of the UNESCO recommendation. Um, so that UNESCO um, called on all of us um, to work on it, um, international collaboration, um, joint efforts on collaborative development and use of OER, um, including capacity building, repositories and community of, communities of practice, um, and, um, and supporting um, intercultural communication. And, um, and, and I think that this has been uh, really like a, a lot of these, um, these values and ideals have been, um, have been reflected in this project. Um, but what is the project? Well, um, first of all, what is the problem? Um, what the, the this project came about um, because, as as we um, I think probably all know, um, in um, our kind of society of today, everything is increasingly datafied, um, and um, and our our data is being um, is being collected in uh, at, at every turn, um, and possibly um, used. In, um, in ways that we're not really comfortable with and that we um, wouldn't have agreed to if we, um, if we really had the power um, not to. Um, and sometimes we don't really have any choice, but we think it's better that people are aware and are able to be critically engaged in, um, in critiquing this than in simply saying, well, you know, I don't have much power and there's not much I can do about it. Um, so I think, you know, what was interesting to us is that the issue of datafication um, has, has become quite a major sort of uh, research problem. But from an education point of view, um, a lot of data education is, um, is at the much more at the skills level of, 
um, you know, what, what are the sorts of things that um, students need to know how to do with bits of data. And, um, and so uh, we thought the role of higher education in, in this, um, in this kind of education needs to be wider than simply providing students with, um, with some relevant skills. And we um, felt that, uh, that, that we needed to draw on open and critical pedagogy approaches um, to work on this. And Caroline. Yes, well, uh, basically, um, we wanted to make sure that what we address is this idea that data is not raw, but cooked. And that's um, Robert Kitchen uh, quote, saying that the cooking of the data does not take place in a vacuum, but it's within a context. And also that these data driven technologies or endeavors or whatever is happening, which is data driven, is really a socio technical system and the social aspect of this socio technical system was key for us. And so these systems are the result of human values, desires and social relations of power. I'm adding this is my addition. And they are also scientific principles and technology. So how do we manage these two things? We have the impression that the scientific principles were the ones that were addressed more with these kind of more um, technical skills. The next slide, Leo, please. And so this, this, this social dimension of data and the understanding of the socio-technical nature of this was for us kind of the conceptual position where we kind of stood on top of it. And so we designed ways of challenging these unproblematic ideas like, wow, the data revolution, how amazing, how, and we really wanted to problematize that. And so that kind of was, I would say, our, I'm not very good at French, but raison d'entrée, do you say, it, more or less? So that was, yeah, for us. So the next slide, please, I'm Leo. And yeah, so how did we address the problem? And what I want to say here is open and critical pedagogy was really the the core of what we did. And we took from Freire this idea that really being literate is not knowing how to read the word only, but we need to be able to read the world. And in that way, we become active subjects that we can do things to change history. And so in the world of data and algorithms so this statified world, um, it is really particular particularly problematic if we stay just as the objects of history, because as Freire says, which I find really for us, it was kind of so, you know, bing, um, objects are known and acted upon. And this is what happens when we are just data points, whereas subjects, the one we want to foster and create and, you know, help to, to form are those who know and act. And I think this is really what we wanted to do. Um, yeah, the next one, please. <laughs> And so what did we do? Um, so we devised an international collaboration. Um, so we started to think, well, we want to do this OER. We want to foster critical data literacy. Who do we want to involve? And then um, we did this, this international collaboration. And you can see on the right-hand slide, we worked with the University of La Republica and Nucleo Rea, which are um, Uruguay. We worked with Etangasa University College with um, our lovely Judith Pett that we, I think, all know. Um, we worked with the University, the Open University of Catalonia with Juliana Raffaelli. And in Surrey, we worked here in England with Carla Bonina. And well, we created lots of materials and um, resources. You're gonna see that we're gonna, we're gonna uh, walk you through. Um, so yeah, then um, the next slide, yes, there. Um, and I, I think I want to just clarify here, there are lots of things that were born as our conceptual work when we were thinking about things. And this is one of these that I think encapsulate really our guiding principles. What This is our ethics as method, model and framework that we wish educators can use. And it's gonna be a tool, a downloadable tool with um, explanation. And if you go Leo, to the link, just very quickly, if you don't mind, in the slide there is, in, if you, if you um, touch in guiding principles, um, you can see the link. Yeah, there, exactly. Uh, okay, don't worry, we do that yeah. at the very end. Yeah, I so you can see the link there or not? Yeah, I'm not but, sure uh, if hold you... on a second, I'll just... Uh... Yeah. 
thank you. And if you touch in interactive tools, Leo, please. So this is kind of our side with, with the project and then the data ethics framework. Yeah. And so you can see here, and if you can scroll down a bit, Leo, you, you, the idea is that each of these dimensions are going to be explained. Um, and, and so we're going to go into the theory of it and how do you think about them and what other things you want to do. So we can go back to our presentation now. But these principles really, and this is an outcome, um, it's also a paper that we wrote and it's um, on its way um, to be uh, published. And it really guided the work we did, but at the same time is part of what we what we uh, achieved here. So the next slide, please. No, um, um, sorry, um, Leo, if you could, the um, underlying um, literature and the underpinning literature that we reviewed to build up the um, the resource gave us an idea that uh, data ethics, data literacy, and all sorts of skills related with data were fragmented in the different kind of data ecosystems. So if you uh, wanted to do data-driven projects, you kind of follow any of the, uh, or could follow any of the guidelines for data ethics, but there wasn't, it's not one. So basically what we did here is to sit down, look at the work that we have done, uh, look at the literature, look at the projects that have been developing and put together underpinning principles, um, principles from research ethics, from bioethics, from data ethics, and also from uh, data literacy in general, not just uh, at technical level, but also practical and um, participatory level. And this is how we built up uh, this ethics as a method framework. So, uh, and yeah, it, and, and as the prof mentioned in the chat, it is well connected with all the frameworks, including frameworks for teaching data literacy in education and um, how to deal with data-driven po policies at government level. Um, Leo. So um, our first case, case study is, is your why. Um, what we did with them, it's we built up in past experience to create a brand new um, course. Um, it is quite interesting that uh, uh, the nuclear rea has had an, a past and an experience and in doing things related with data and, and with open education. So that's why we chose to work with them. Our initial plan was to have a summer school, uh, which of course it was halted by uh, the bugs surrounding us. Um, so what uh, we did is to design the course to be, of course, uh, delivered online because we couldn't we couldn't travel. Uh, but in in order to level up the understanding of concepts, because we were talking about data and data ethics and and things that. Everyone seems to understand, but basically not at the same level. We created like a, a leveling course that it was uh, self-paced. And there was a prerequisite to uh, enroll in the main course, which was basically designed to have two weeks of intensive training with talks and workshops and loads of activities and loads of readings. And two weeks to give the participants the space to think um, and to do a group work, which has like two main well, three main conditions. They couldn't be from the same subject subject area. They couldn't be from the same gender and it couldn't be from this, all, all from the same country. So we kind of pushed up the groups to be interdisciplinary, international and diverse as much as we could. So we gave them some, some topics um, to, to do some research on. Always thinking on the pedagogy behind the project. It's not just to analyze a data project just because, we just tell, told them like, how would you address this issue with your students? Um, and the participants just published their assignments. So um, we're gonna show you the site later, but um, uh, on how all the, and actually they, the idea of like sharing their outcome uh, uh, outside the, 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 the safe space of, of, of the uh, online learning space was to uh, give them a space for co-construct knowledge with future users of the content. So um, if we can move forward, please. Um, 
one of the things that this is what I was mentioning, Uruguay has a, well, the University of La Republic in Uruguay has a center for open education and also it's very well connected with civil society organizations such as ILDA and Data Uruguay and also with the government, so with AGESIC. So they, they do things with data and this is why we, we say, okay, okay, we're gonna work through this, but also we managed to get it accredited. So it was an internally accredited CPT that gave credits and as the credits sometimes are recognized within um, South American institutions, um, also anyone that was from Colombia or from Chile or from uh, Brazil can validate those credits. Um, the content was translated and contextualized. So we used lots of local examples just to try to get into people's head in a way or another, but understanding that the impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning is not the same in South America than in North America, because in South America still, um, there is no such development of algorithmic um, decision-making. So if we can move forward, please. Um, we had lots of talks, uh, friends from everyone, from, from everywhere. One of the things, it was it was really, really great of this project that whoever we called said, yes, I'd love to give a talk or i love to do a podcast. Because if, if we look, talk with lots of people from the civil society, so most of our speakers come from the civil society or from the private sector and also government. But it was really good to have to belong to a community of data and the, the belongings of the community of open data. We have people from almost everywhere that spoke Spanish or in, in the case of the podcast, podcast didn't and giving talks and giving their advice and how to bring the data into the teaching and learning. Um, Leo, thanks. If you can move forward. Um, of course, time was a time constraint and we had some challenges with the technology and accessible and digital poverty is an issue. Uh, but one of the things we, we want to uh, keep uh, from, from the reflections from the people, from what we said, it's we'd love to have as a summer school, but also that will be quite restrictive for the ones that will not be allowed to, to travel and to meet or to leave behind the caring responsibilities just to be with us for two weeks. So I think it needs to be a combination of like in real life person and also give this opportunity to continue online um, connecting with peers across the continent or across the world. So if we move forward, some of the few reflections, um, we just got to get people into understanding what data was. Um, people was really pleased with other methodology, um, <laughs> the talks of our experts. Uh, we were very flexible because it, we also had to adapt of the things that were going on at, at the time. Um, um, it wasn't always easy to, to try to change dynamics but was when things were happening. Um, if you can move forward, that was our largest, basically our largest a pilot. So um, um, the course was meaningful for people. And I think we managed to work in a very collegial tone. We acknowledged that every participant wasn't equal to, to us. And also we were learning from them as well. So people felt like they were not in a training course that where they would be trained. It was more like a professional, a constant professional conversation between the team, the experts and them. So everyone was like very, very pleased. Uh, and that's it for me. Yes, thank you, Javiera. Um, yeah, I, I um, and in, in, <clears throat> in each of the case studies, I think that the, it was really different. Um, and I think here, one of the, the things that comes really across all the case studies is the, impol the importance of culture and open culture in the place. So in Kenya, what we did is a small, very small group of lecturers. And here is Judith. He was the lead in, in Tangasa University. And we did, um, it was <clears throat> like in two instances, we did first a workshop where we kind of showed them the content that is available. We did some very particular activities and then they thought about it how can we use it and then they came back and reflected about that um, so it's like a coaching approach really it's not a professional development approach in the sense of we didn't have an accreditation and you know you, you we didn't and, and that i think makes a whole difference um, what i think here was very interesting is how the materials were developed and we really wanted to make it local and we wanted to make it contextual and we wanted to make it meaningful for the Kenyan context 
And so we had interviews with, for example, um, David Salasi Opoku, who is a brilliant uh, human being. Um, so we talked with him, what is for you critical data literacy? How have you done this? What is your experience? And then we debated um, with our group of people and other scholars, what are the things that really need to be in? What are the ethical aspects? How do you think about food security and ethics at the same time? And the way we wanted to do this is that the social problems that they had to work with and that were in the workshop were local to them. And I think that was really great. And we developed um, a booklet that was for students and teachers. And that was also quite interesting. Um, the next one, Leo, and, and I'm, I think, yeah, I'm go th this one is important, but I'm gonna go faster. So we have time, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious about the time. So the challenges, I think, and the future plans in this particular um, instance, but also generally, I think, is there is really a constraint for educators to be available, in particular in Tangasa University. Um, there is, it, it is difficult to get them together and to properly do a development, professional development. And I think it's always about them being very keen to participate and wanting to learn, but I think we, that was a challenge. One needs to go beyond that. And then the other thing really as as, as you know, establishing these kind of um, international funding mechanisms, and also how do you, you know, how, how do you really um, engineer a partnership that is long lasting? And I think that was a challenge as well. Um, the next one, uh, Leo, please. So we think that understanding these mechanisms really should be part of a if, if we get a, a, so we want to extend our work and further and deepen what we do. But I think part of what we need to really investigate as part of our project are these kind of cooperative mechanisms and funding mechanisms. How are they and how do they work? So I just wanted to say that. Um, participants were quite, um, they used it quite quickly. Um, that, that was in a business school where um, Judith works and they do, of course, open data for open innovation was for them great because they could apply it in the modules they were, um, they were using. And then the university had this open week and then they used a lot of the things they learned for the activities they planned in that open week. Um, the next one, please. And in England, um, we worked with Carla Onina, which was a, a really, a, a, an, again, I would say, and it's something that makes a difference when you have someone that knows, is, is, it makes it easier. There we did a co-teaching approach. So Carla and the team, we uh, saw, well, how can we embed the material that we created? So she included that in her reading list. He then included the ethical approach into her um, assessment, which was great. Um, because that makes students, of course, engage more in the, in the, um, I would say, in the material. So it was really part of what they were doing. Um, we provided a session with Flor Serale, uh, which we also did in Uruguay. Um, so she could uh, walk the students through the ethics canvas, and that was incredibly useful. And, and the people in Uruguay also had said that was a highlight. The next one, please, Leo. <clears throat> So as I said, um, co-teaching is a highlight. It makes it really effective, time effective. And also I think the way in which you, 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 you get the materials through the students, it, it's really easier. And embedding things in assessment makes a whole difference, I would say. Um, and in this case in particular, in, 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 in England, one thing that stood out is that it's not only about the OER, but it's really the critical approach to data literacy, which I think was, was very obvious. And you're going to see why, because one of the students were um, that they were a team and they were the next one, Leo, and they were a team and they were working in an assignment. And one of them said, I had no idea about these ethical aspects here. I had no idea that I really had to think about this so deeply. So the questions that were provided in the workshop of the, of, of the ethics canvas, for example, were enlightening. And they were saying, I'm going to take this back to home because we really, and they were doing an app for health services. And they, they, they were just really, you know, it was eye-opening. The next one, Leo, please. Um, 
Yeah, then we had a, um, a collaboration in uh, Barcelona with uh, Juliana in the Uni Open University of Catalonia. That was a non-formal um, kind of uh, professional development or learning experience. And it was, again, not accredited, so that makes a difference. It was run through a month, um, the whole thing. So we did an introduction, introductory workshop for the whole event. Then we had invited speakers that addressed particular topics. Then they were left with materials that they could use templates to do um, curriculum design and assessment. They then worked through that and then they came back and reflected for a last session. The next, please, Leo. <clears throat> yeah, so highlights. Um, I think that working with, and, and Harry was saying the same thing in, in Uruguay, with, a, with pedagogical designs on this topic, which is really new, was a highlight um, for everyone that they were saying. And the invited speakers, um, we had the chance to talk to them like in, in a more closed space. And many of them were saying that preparing for the talk um, was for them eye-opening as well. And here it stands out really the open culture that is in Uruguay because so many of the speakers in Uruguay were just really into open data as their DNA. And, and, and you can see how when that is not part of your DNA, being exposed to these talks really brings that kind of insight into your own kind of um, profession. And participation was really difficult. And again, I think it has to do with networks, with the accreditation of the professional development program, and that makes a huge difference. Um, the next one. Um, yeah, so participate, uh, participants again said that it was eye-opening. Someone said that the level, so the, the whole kind of graphic elements and the design of our, our materials and the site was really motivating and not being a, 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 a specialist, not knowing all of the materials of, for example, open data and all the things we addressed, but having an OER that allows them to get into it, but using these materials was a highlight for them as well. The next one, please. Yeah, so well, why does this matter? Um, uh, well, I think there's so much to say here. Um, and I'm happy to open this to Harry, Leo, and myself. Um, I think the first topic, Leo, this is a point that you were making, which is, I think, quite important here. So you can talk yeah, about that one. When, when we were thinking about the vision and the kind of the format of this, which ended up being, uh, I, I guess, very kind of multi-format because each kind of pilot group was, was quite different. Um, but we, we, we were sort of, we didn't exactly want it to be a MOOC and we didn't want it to be only an OER. So I think that the, the, um, the, the strength of this, but of course also, you know, one of the reasons that it's, um, it, it's a lot of work to do was really the close collaboration to make it local and make it, a, um, make it um, not only a set of resources, but um, an interaction with a, within a community in each context. Yeah, and so it's, it's again giving the tools to teachers to train their students is important, but the academic development, as what Leo was saying, is key so that really it, it renders to something fruitful. And and also we thought about like people is already overwhelmed with training being thrown at them during the time they, they spend most of the time online teaching and doing most of the social activities. So we needed to design something that it wasn't again overwhelming because the topic was really, really dense and the case studies they had to read or the material, it was actually quite sometimes emotionally um, distressing uh, because you have to talk about racism, discrimination, sexism and all the things like that. So we needed to design a way that gave them all the food for thought, but the space to breathe and also work offline. So we have this synchronous, asynchronous, um, connected, disconnected approach where everyone could talk around, but we didn't, for example, promote a WhatsApp group. We promote people to keep on the chat so they won't have been bombarded by several channels, but we kept a conversation going on on Twitter. So if you look for the hash data praxis, you will see some of the conversations that were happening over there. And, and 
one thing I want to add here is that I think in the international was like a little um, ginger root, if you wish. We had this um, this rhizomatic thing that happened that within Uruguay, for example, again, although Uruguay is part of the big project being international, but within the international, sorry, within the Uruguayan chapter, we had again an international thing going on because we had people from all over Latin America, we, not only Uruguay, we had Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, um, um, we had um, Argentina, we had lots, so I don't want, you know, but it was again, and that then I think it was really rhizomatic in how each of the experiences were international and international in itself, not all of them, but many. Um, the next slide, Leo, um, I'm conscious that we already have our time. Um, and then, you know, what are the challenges here of the international collaboration? Um, and I think, again, we all can talk to this because it's, um, yeah, I think it, it's really resource and time consuming um, when you design the resources. We were, we did work incredibly much. Um, and, and, and the, the, you know, yeah, I, I just think it's time consuming and, and it's something that we're passionate about. And here is where the passion comes out. We were just tirelessly doing things and motivating each other and, you know, because we love what we do and, and, and but it's a lot of work. Um, and I think the, institu the institutional culture is critical, really that in international collaborations is something that one needs to think at the beginning, you know, what is the culture of this institution and how I think the, um, Orla was saying about we buy in people that are already and you work easier. Uruguay is a perfect example when you have a culture of open. What if you don't have it and you want to bring them into the culture? Is that needs to be part of a project? How the time you need? What do you do? How do you approach people? How do you convince them? That, that needs to be thought about, I think. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the mechanisms um, of a collaboration, I think that really needs, um, needs time and needs thinking. How do you do that? We did it, I think, organically and it was brilliant. Um, but I guess it's, it's a work that is also a very conceptual work. You need to think about how can we improve that um, collaboration? So it's, if you want to make a long-term project, let's say four-year project, that I think those mechanisms um, could be explored deeper and, and that, that will help. And yeah, um, I think we are who we are. Thank you very much. And there is the site, Leo, if you can just share for a second, one minute or two, I think that that would take us to. Um... So you just need to be quick. You are a little bit over time already. Um, yeah. I just want to the other presenters. So that yeah, so that you can see in that site, you have the modules there available, you can, um, you can go to them, there are activities, interactive things, all of it, you have interactive tools to work with, you have the resources, which are the PDF that you can download, which are the modules completely, all the modules as, as, a, as a standalone. Um, so yeah, if you go there, you can see um, that you can go to Senodo and download all of the resources that are there. They're all open licensed and um, yeah. And thank you very much. You can, um, the, the, sh the link is shared in our slide. So you can curious, you can go and we're happy and open to whatever. Um, yes, if you want to use it, if you want to have, um, I don't know, training, whatever you need, we're, we're really open and, and keen to, to move this um, outside of our space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much Thanks. for you. Very interesting. Um, we're going to move on to the final two presenters. <clears throat> and if anyone has questions, we will see if we've got a few minutes at, at the end. Um, thanks, Rob. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Rob Farrow from the Open University to talk about the Gojian Guide to Conceptual Frameworks. Over to you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm Rob Farrow from the Open University and um, today, uh, although I've been talking about various different projects, today I'm talking about uh, uh, GoGN at the conference. And uh, here's what I'm gonna cover. We're focused on the Conceptual Frameworks Handbook, which was uh, published uh, this month. And um, I'm gonna give you a bit of background on GoGN, explain why we did a Conceptual Frameworks Handbook um, a bit about the way it's presented, 
um, a bit about conceptual frameworks in general and their relationship to research, uh, specifically doctoral level research, um, and then a quick guide to the guide. So I'm going to go through what's included and then tell you a bit about um, next steps for GoGen publications. I'm going to try and do it in 20 minutes. So let's go. So first of all, GoGN, what is it? GoGN is the Global OER Graduate Network. You can check out the website, go-gn.net. And we are a network of support for anyone doing uh, doctoral research into open education anywhere in the world. Um, GoGN has been running since 2013. Um, it came into the stewardship of the team at the Open University. I think it was 2018, could be corrected on that. Um, it's funded by the um, Hewlett Foundation and organized from the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University. And GoGen has three primary goals. Firstly, to raise the profile of research in open education. Uh, secondly, to offer support to those doing PhD research in the area. Um, and we're also interested in um, exploring openness as a, a process of research. Um, and this is something that's been kind of um, more our focus at the Open University uh, since it's come into our uh, care. And um, in some ways, what I'm going to talk about today is reflects this. It also reflects some of the uh, co-creation stuff that was um, spoken about um, earlier in the session um, and about how co-creating can um, help reinforce and support community formation. So uh, we have about 300 members in GoGN. There's about 100 uh, doctoral and postdoctoral researchers, uh, but anyone can join the network as a friend. Um, so we have another 200 people plus who are um, interested parties, PhD supervisors, mentors, that kind of thing. So why a conceptual frameworks handbook? Um, so if you're familiar with GoGN, and I know that some of you are, um, last year, we published uh, a research methods handbook, and this was uh, something that was developed um, really in response to the needs that people said that they had as uh, PhD students and AD students, where they didn't always feel comfortable um, uh, discussing that they didn't feel um, they understood all the research methods they were supposed to or that they uh, could have done with help and understanding how does this all relate to open education or openness as a way of doing things. Um, so last year we published this research methods handbook and the way that it was written is um, we asked our members to contribute their own insights into using different research methods. Um, and so we sort of grounded it in um, sharing people's experiences, which is not the way that most people um, go into exploring research methods. It's normally quite a dry sort of subject. Um, and uh, this was um, very well received. Um, ended up being a lot more popular than we necessarily thought it would be. And it was shared quite widely outside of our own sort of, um, networks. Um, and the Research Methods Handbook was a winner of an uh, uh, excellence award last year at the conference. And um, it was always anticipated that we would have um, a follow-up to this, a companion volume. Um, and that's how the Conceptual Frameworks Guide came about. In some ways, I've said this sort of semi-jokingly to a few people, it was a bit of a difficult second album because the first one was so well received. Um, but also research methods is, is a much more commonly trodden path than conceptual frameworks. But the idea was with this follow-up uh, volume, to focus on theoretical perspectives and how theories are used around open education. Um, and this is, you know, more widely this idea of conceptual frameworks, which is a bit more of a, a bit more of a loose um, term. So um, we had contributions from more than uh, 20 people in here. And the idea is to give an overview of how conceptual frameworks are used in research, but then also provide um, testimony about using specific uh, theoretical and conceptual frameworks in people's own research. Um, so you can just download the book, it's CC BY, and you can share it uh, freely. So what's, what's different about our way of approaching it? One thing is the way of people sharing their own insights, it's like a sort of open practice. 
uh, but we also try to make it all as accessible as possible and to try and take some of the intimidation out of um, the more kind of uh, philosophically complex aspects of uh, the foundations of research. So for instance here, this is from the uh, last year's, this is the, the iceberg showing you that method is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the kind of thing that you need to engage with. Um, similarly, this is quite a complex table in some ways with um, a spectrum of uh, different kind of um, understandings of truth and how these relate to different uh, paradigmatic philosophical positions and related um, research methods. Uh, but if you put some penguins and a rainbow in there, then it kind of looks a bit less uh, fearsome. This is the idea anyway. Um, just to give another example, um, this was a redrawn graphic. So we did a combination of redrawing things from other places, creating our own and um, doing sort of mashups like the previous one I showed you. This is from an open university course. It's been uh, re rewritten as a, a, a map, uh, like an orientation map. So we already had this artistic style. If you're interested in uh, more on that, then there's a, a paper that you can look up. Um, the concept for the new um, uh, uh, guide was the idea of a conceptual framework being like a vehicle. So we had all these kind of various transport motifs in the previous one as well. But the idea of conceptual frameworks being like vehicles to get you where you need to go in your research project. And this sort of reflects the idea that everyone's conceptual framework can be a bit different. And um, we had this idea of like a wacky races or gumball rally approach where everyone's trying to get to this destination, but because everyone's PhD is different, it's gonna be uh, different. Everyone's vehicle is gonna be different and it's gonna be designed to do something different. So um, just briefly, what's written about conceptual frameworks? Um, the quick answer is not as anything like as much as is written about um, research methods in general. Um, and part of the, the sort of sto the story here is that lots of uh, people use terms like theory, theoretical framework and conceptual framework quite ambiguously. And so this leads to people being unable to distinguish those things or to think, OK, I just need to write this, you know, choose a theory and, and mess around with it a little bit. And now I've got this good theoretical foundation for what I'm working on. Um, and the idea is that if you don't get this right, it comes out in your work. Um, now, I would freely admit, I've never spent as much time thinking about conceptual frameworks as I did this year, right, for writing this. And I think that most people, you know, it's not at the forefront of what you're, you're doing um, when you're doing research. But if you don't get it right and you end up with a misalignment, in your in your research, that comes out and it has it has a, a, a consequence for the validity of what you're doing. So um, there's lots of different things that can go wrong in terms of missing something, misaligning it, not having a framework, uh, just chucking in some big names and hoping that that's enough to make it look contemporary and thought through, uh, lip service to theories, these kinds of things. So these are the kind of things that we're trying to avoid. Um, what is a conceptual framework? The most complete um, description that I found is this one you can see here highlighted at the top. Personal interests and goals, social location and positionality, topical research, like stuff that's in the news, theoretical frameworks. And you put all these things together and you have your conceptual framework, but we'd never see it written down like that. Because by the time it's written down, if it even is written down, because most of the time you don't have to have a conceptual frameworks chapter, um, you have to have a methods chapter, but you don't have to have a conceptual framework chapter. Um, it depends on what you're doing, of course. Um, but again, it's a bit more ambiguous, a bit less well defined. Um, I think there are fewer rules in some ways and it's more flexible and that can be a strength. It can also be something that you need to pay attention to, uh, to keep yourself on track. Um, I would say, that there's basically two approaches that you can find. Firstly, the idea of a conceptual framework being the organizing principle for everything else about the project. And the second is the idea that it's just part of a, a, a combination of different things that come together and then that is your research project. So it's whether it's a component or whether it's more like a, a lodestar that you're organizing your work around. Um, metaphors are common with this stuff. Um, so, for instance, people talk about um, 
the, the scaffolding for their project or how things are bridging different ideas together, these architectural um, metaphors. Um, it might also be that people talk about um, that they've got, you know, a geographical um, way of looking at things. Um, and people talk about mapping things together and this sort of stuff. Um, and also this, you know, these schematas where it's all about the diagram or whatever. Um, and I think these, these can all be really positive, but the danger is you can get a bit lost in your own metaphors as well, right? If you go too far into any of these. So it's understanding when are these tools that are helping you and when is it actually obscuring the thing that you're trying to understand. So taking the idea of a conceptual framework as the overall organizing principle, you can see here in this uh, graphic how that might fit together. Everything flows into your conceptual framework and that's um, your own positionality as a researcher, um, but also the various theories that you've been looking at, what's happening in your world at the moment, what kind of things are you thinking about? This can all kind of come together into a conceptual framework. And this is how um, some uh, people have presented it. It's the, over, it's the sort of organizing, animating principle. The alternative is characterized by um, Passy's approach, where you he will just say, look, models, conceptual frameworks, theoretical frameworks, and theories, these are all very specific things that have specific definitions. And um, all of them are essentially constructs, right? All of them are kind of made up, made up things that are there to help you do the thing that you're trying to do. So in both of these approaches, we get a similar sort of pragmatism, but it's whether you see the conceptual framework as something that's overarching. Um, so I won't go into too much detail on these, but um, this provides um, some of the definitions that he's talking about with examples of different um, uh, conceptual and theoretical frameworks that, that kind of uh, examples that fit those. Um, so um, we use some of these ideas to create new tables and new diagrams and things that would uh, hopefully try to make it all a bit easier to understand how it all fits together. Uh, we also have some stuff in there which is uh, a bit more deconstructive. So the idea of looking at how concepts are generated as socio-historically socio contingent things that can be um, investigated and broken down a bit. Um, this gives rise to a very qualitative approach in Jabberine's work, where um, the idea is that um, conceptual frameworks really are qualitative things that are there to help us theorize, and they arise from texts, especially if we see texts as sort of multimedia things as well as just words on a page. Um, at the other end of the scale, a more quantitative approach we look at is the idea of network analysis. So this could be like a citation analysis, for instance, as in this case, where you don't start off with ideas, you start off with numbers of some sort and um, quantitative data. And from that, you allow a picture to emerge, um, which gives you your sort of concepts. So um, in that sense, it's more emergent. Um, one question with all this stuff is whether you should create a new framework for a new, every bit of research or use an existing one. I think sometimes, um, especially doctoral researchers, feel a bit of pressure to come up with an original framework. Um, but this can cause problems and it can be better just to kind of use an existing one that's been validated already. Uh, we also go into a bit of detail around um, how a conceptual framework can be used to, um, uh, to reinforce the sort of doctoral level reflections that you are expected to do. And um, some people say this is the kind of distinctive challenge of doctoral research is being able to sort of metacognize this stuff at the level of a conceptual framework. Um, so you can see how um, in this, we uh, sort of suggest that diff different use cases for conceptual frameworks at different points in the life cycle of research. You could potentially draw that different ways, but um, um, it might look different for different pieces of research and that kind of thing. But you can understand conceptual frameworks as the place where you get to uh, express the sort of doctorateness of your research. Um, and that's what this diagram is intended to convey. It's at the very sort of abstract conceptual meta level that, con that conceptual frameworks um, can really be the most useful. Now, I won't go through um, all of the conceptual frameworks that we actually discuss in the book, um, but here's the list. You can have a quick look yourself. Um, and they're the kind of things that, I mean, it's not exhaustive. There are other things that you could include, but it does reflect actual work being done 
right now by researchers in open education. And so I would suggest uh, go and have a look. There's brief descriptions plus testimony from people um, who've used them. We also were able to include an additional list because it was on a CC BY license. Um, and so these are some shorter um, descriptions and these cover lots of other areas that aren't necessarily uh, covered by our own researchers. And so it's a pretty good overall guide to um, getting in involved in conceptual frameworks and, and getting a taste for the kind of things that are out there. So I would just like to take the opportunity to thank all the people and co-authors who contributed uh, to the guide and um, encourage you to have a quick look um, at the guide and share it. Um, and just to finish off, um, I wanna just tell you what's next on uh, the GoGN publications track. Um, so later this year, we'll publish our review of research for 2021. We currently got them papers are out with our researchers at the moment. Um, we'll have our annual review in December. Then next year, we, we're interested in doing second editions of both the Research Methods Handbook and the Conceptual Frameworks Guide. And the idea will be to combine them along with some other uh, stuff that's available, CC BY, um, not necessarily written by us, could be other people, but to make a sort of definitive um, manual for anyone coming in and wanting to do research uh, in this area, which is quite accessible. Um, but the idea is that if someone's starting off a PhD in open education, we can give them that book on day one and say, here you go, it's got all three years worth of research reviews, plus all this other stuff, and it's a good place for you to start doing work in this area. So hopefully that contributes towards building capacity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Rob. It's an incredible resource. I think I'm kind of feeling like up and coming PhD students now have an advantage. <laughs> what we did many years back where we had to kind of <laughs> struggle. No conceptual frameworks in my day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we had to build our own. But anyway, but this is wonderful work. And I mean, I think these resources have a place everywhere. And I can imagine using it in my own work at the University of Cape Town for students and my supervision. And yeah, I think we just need to do a lot of advocacy and share, share them as widely as possible. Um, yeah. and, and, and you know, I think that you need a framework. Yeah. You you can't not have one. I'm really sorry, but that's not an option because I thought this, and it, it's not. So the work is so so important because you have to have a theoretical framework. It really, well, I think so in my experience. So I think yeah, it's a great um, resource to use for our PhD students and 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 research, even in, at the master's level. You know. Thanks, Caroline. Yes, yeah, certainly in our in our context, um, South African universities. If you're doing a PhD, you really need to have a conceptual framework, um, especially in the humanities. So that's great. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, we're going to move on to the last presentation, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time just to run through what we've uh, seen this morning and and ask some other questions. And yes, contributions to second editions, of course. Okay, so it's over now to both Daniel Ellers and uh, Katarina Kunze. I'm not sure if Katarina's here or if Wolf is doing this. Um, building a European OER ecosystem um, and in state of play across these four different areas, technology, policy, quality, business and innovation. So thank you very much. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hello and uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, um, from our side, Katarina and me, we um, are very happy to be here and um, share the thoughts we have um, uh, from a different corner of the Encore project. You have heard a lot of, um, uh, of the Encore project um, today already. And um, we would like to share from this project a little bit this um, the launch, um, let's say, report um, process. Um, as you have heard, we are in early stages. Um, uh, that means we have a couple of months into the project now. And um, what we are doing, of course, like uh, it is good practice in all the project, is to gather together the intelligence 
what's on stake around OER. And that's what we would like to present to you. We are not quite ready. So this is a bit of report from a uh, surgery of the open heart, so to speak, um, directly from the workbench. Not final truth, but really more provocations, which we bring to you. Um, and maybe that's also a bit more lively because uh, now the session is already to its close and between us, uh, between lunch and, and, and now uh, it's only us. Um, uh, but we try to uh, keep, keep to the time. As you know, and just for those who have um, just switched in to the session now, uh, Encore is building uh, four circle communities around four OER topics because we want to provide a sustainable OER community and integrate more um, the separated environment into one ecosystem. So that's the idea. We have a couple of partners around the table from all over Europe. Um, it's an amazing project. Um, we are a partner from Germany. So if anybody here is from Germany, let's try to um, find collaboration uh, opportunities. And in my own university, I've been the vice president for teaching and academic affairs uh, six years. And I've always tried to bring an OER policy to our university. And that was, as it is in all institutions, um, uh, very, very difficult. But when I went around our big, big university, we are the biggest university in the southwest of Germany. Uh, when I went around through the, through the schools and the, the departments and so on, I often found people who said, well, I don't know about an, an, a full OER policy for our institution to go open for everyone and for, for you know, having it as a mainstream policy, mainstream process. Um, but of course, we are sharing our materials. And yes, we have a Moodle room in which we are sharing materials with many other colleagues. But no, we, do, we would not like to share this. You know? And then we developed this idea of um, sharing clubs within our university. And I think this is uh, very important to see that the future, that's at least what we take also from, from, from literature and from practice interviews, the future of OER in institutions will probably have different degrees also of what openness means actually and to what intensity and to what frame of openness uh, we are uh, willing to share. So that's a, a small story from our own uh, institute. I'm heading an institute now and um, working on uh, several projects uh, in the field of um, uh, transformation through technology and education and openness is uh, for sure one of the main uh, main routes we are we are we are following. So let me come to the core of what what Katarina and me would like to present to you um, for the Encore project, like a, a launch pad, so to speak, a launch pad ideas. Yeah. Um, we are gathering together intelligence to provide a fundamental thought inventory inspired by research surveys and interviews. How That's how we would like to uh, call this, what we present to you. And we have organized it in five different provocations. Um, uh, so we have done that through um, research literature, of course, through um, uh, interviews with experts, uh, just five now, but very, very interesting, deep, um, qualitative interviews, um, and uh, also um, a, a survey. So the provocation one, which uh, we um, want to put on the table for discussion, really, is the idea that, um, that OER is moving towards a normalization phase in higher education. Uh, whereas, by the way, in business is still a very, very wide spot. Um, and what we mean with that is that the usage and the uptake of OER in higher education is more and more becoming a matter of pragmatics. So what we would like to debate here is this assumption that the old Cold War-like um, philosophy wars and paradigm wars um, uh, are, are more and more over uh, and that using OER is more a question of, um, uh, so to speak, pragmatic um, considerations. 
We have, as you know, uh, from the OER world map um, in many, many countries in Europe, at least, um, OER accessible, not in all countries of the world, but um, in for, for Europe, for Germany, at least I can say that uh, it's quite a mature infrastructure in many other European countries uh, as well. We see that more and more. Um, so the question is not the, really the question of availability or um, accessibility. The question is really the question of um, are we, um, so to speak, having an attitude which allows us to see what's available and allows us to take stock of what's available and allows us to start using. And we believe that probably we are still working on persona concepts here, that probably there are different attitudes around the table um, of educators, also for students, of course, and also for, for let's say, institutional policymakers. But um, specifically, we are looking at educators now. So there are educators like Florence, for example, uh, if you would imagine it as a persona, as a prototypical, so to speak, uh, attitude. Florence, who's open to share everything she is doing and also open to use things others are sharing. Then there might be another persona, Lena. Lena would in principle also share and use shared materials, use OER, but um, she believes there needs to be um, an organizational mandate. So an organizational policy needs to be in place, a little bit of a, a, a room of legitimation uh, uh, around that. And then there is another persona, Niels, he's really a very pragmatic guy. Uh, he's a teacher and he has really nothing against it, but he wouldn't really do, you know, a big efforts to find and um, select and quality check. So Niels really wants, uh, if he's to use OER, he wants to have it from his school department pre-selected and then he's ready to do it. And I think this is um, at least from our experience and also what we can see from studies of attitudes now um, uh, coming on the research scene more and more. Um, uh, and I also uh, want to show you later a little bit in a study on attitudes, which we have done now in the last weeks. This is really uh, the situation in many, many higher education um, uh, contexts uh, where people are coming together. So that's the provocation one. Provocation two, learning futures in higher education will be blended experience, combining um, OER and non-OER. So we believe that um, open infrastructures, that for higher education, open infrastructures, open educational resources, repositories, um, uh, and um, uh, so to speak, closed infrastructures are going to be um, elements uh, of a higher education teaching and learning experience uh, of the future. Um, and with this actually relating a little bit to the provocation number one, we are overcoming this uh, either or shift. And policy is not a matter of either or policy then is really a matter of encouraging OER where it's useful for the individual. And when it has to be useful again, the attitudes come into play because usefulness is very, very much an individual perceived subjective um, evaluation of, of the situation. So we believe, or at least that's what we would like to put on the table now in the beginning of the Encore project, when we are building our community circles, that learning futures in higher education will, in that sense of openness versus closed infrastructures, environments, um, um, uh, be a blended uh, in, in environments. Um, provocation three, the, we believe that the concept which we are now discussing since about 10 years, um, uh, 10, 12 years, uh, the concept of open practice, open educational practice is maturing more and more now. Uh, we are more focusing on quality improvement and innovation in um, higher education scenarios. Higher education, that's the, the context which we are uh, mostly um, um, uh, considering, uh, but um, uh, so focus on quality improvement and quality learning through OER rather than focus on discussions and, and, and projects uh, which are dealing with access, availability, 
um, uh, but more with uh, bringing further the learning environment, um, furthering, developing it further, maturing it, opening it up. Um, these are discussions which we see more and more uh, evolving so that we believe the concept of OEP is maturing. OEP, just uh, to remind us, is this concept in which we are combining the pedagogical innovation and openness on the one dimension together with the uh, usage of OER usage uh, uh, and together in a, so to speak, into a practice uh, um, uh, a practice context. Um, we have uh, just found also in open practice um, uh, a nice uh, review of the uh, OEP um, uh, studies and research papers of the last years and therefore believe pretty much that's, that's uh, actually what the future will be at the discussion um, of uh, open educational practice. Fourth provocation, and uh, remember that we, I, I would like to remind you here that we are um, not just focusing on higher education with the Encore project, but we are focusing on higher education and business and how these two uh, sectors uh, can come together also in a, in a mutually fruitful exchange um, and can learn from each other. Um, uh, and the question here is, are open educational resource right for business training, for business training, for HR? Um, uh, can, can we find cases there also? And if you have cases, if you know of communities um, uh, in which businesses and enterprises are using OER for internal training of their staff, for example, uh, then that would be very interesting. Interesting also, it would be to see if there are institutions with policies. I have found some in our research uh, and we need to see if these are just particular cases of the earth. There's a, um, um, uh, if there's, a, a, so to speak, a scene also maturing, a community maturing, which we can bring together because this is very much the mission of the Encore project. To, um, to link together these individual di um, uh, um, different pockets uh, of initiatives um, uh, throughout Europe into one um, ecosystem in which we can learn and can, uh, so to speak, uh, take stock of processes which are maturing. Um, this false provocation, um, oh, we are in business, it's still a white spot. That's our impression. That's what um, we find so far in research. Um, the question is, why have um, um, private organizations not grabbed OER like hot cake cakes? Um, and then there is another um, dimension to it, and that's the, the question um, of an ad tech OER startup scene um, or a service OER startup scene. We very much believe that the future of higher education will be um, uh, probably consisting at, le at, at least in some parts of um, of unbundled services, so tutoring services, assessment services, content curation services, and so on and so on. Um, um, and that it also will be probably more a networked way of studying from the student's perspective. The students are not starting in University One and graduate in studio, University One, but that it will be like a patchwork, episodical-like uh, pathway through higher education and academic education. And so we believe that pretty much for this, for the OER scene, actually, there are many, many startup service opportunities. And we would like to find throughout Europe, that's really something which we haven't found yet, um, the, the, the question, is there an entrepreneurial, let's say, community um, uh, uh, to, to be identified? Is it possible to identify that uh, uh, or not? Um, and how can we mature this thought um, we know from some companies, uh, our research, research shows, at least for MOOCs, and that's quite a known phenomenon that companies are using for staff training MOOCs, which are, show this picture is showing actually, um, but we are not sure if it's really um, maturing um, and how we can also, uh, in a way, um, uh, support this. 
Provocation five um, is talking about open learning cultures. We are thinking that um, we are moving from individual aspects of OER to more an, um, a combined ecosystem view within the institution, but also uh, on national level to open learning cultures. And we believe that um, um, it is important um, to think about cultures if we want to move our higher education organizations uh, into the open. We believe very much that, um, at least that's our perception, not a belief, it's a perception that um, recent research more and more um, um, uh, asks questions and um, identifies aspects um, to understand how OER um, can be uh, used in an, in an integrated ecosystem view in higher education organization. Um, not so much um, uh, only discussing um, separated uh, individual aspects and dimensions of usage and uptake. Um, and also, we believe that um, uh, in research, more, more focus of, um, we, we are moving from a focus of availability to a focus uh, on, on sharing culture and attitudes and, and motivators. Um, in, in recent research, we have uh, developed a learning culture model, which we would like to suggest now in the beginning of this project also to um, um, develop into an open learning culture model. And it basically says that open learning cultures always uh, relies or rests on two big pillars. The one is the structures a pillar, and the other one is the commitment pillar. The structure is the processes we have in place in our institutions, and the question is, um, how do they support open? How do the infrastructure support open? How do the quality management ideas support open? How do the instruments and rules support open? So that's the structural um, a pillar. And then there's this pillar of commitment, and there's this, the question is, um, which competencies and which capacities do we have with the individual um, uh, actors within our institutions, the teachers, the professional educators, uh, which attitudes do we have, which values are there. And we believe very much that we have too long focused, or well, maybe not too long, but we have, um, uh, have, a, have an experience, have a history of focusing very much on the structures and not so much um, discussing the competencies, attitudes, everyday practices uh, and values, and this needs uh, more attention. Therefore, also, our idea of uptake on OER depends very much on these, these ideas um, of the second pillar, which can also be expressed as trust into OER and trust into sharing also, the attitude of sharing skills and capacities uh, and of course, also tools and infrastructures, but this is more, in our view, a hygienic factor. We have done a survey on that, um, and we found that in this survey, we have uh, faced the same problem uh, many surveys are facing. Um, only the converted were answering. <laughs> so only those who are already aware, like you can see here, We've asked leaders and managers in higher education and business, and we've asked professional educators in higher education and business. So what you see here are the uh, collapsed co um, uh, results from uh, 300 uh, answers. Um, uh, those uh, of those who have answered and participated in the survey, um, um, almost all of them were aware of OER and their use cases. They were using, many of them were using more in the, uh, let's say, educator space, not so much in the leader space. Um, and um, they were um, self-evaluating uh, themselves, uh, having a high capacity. In general, uh, positive attitudes towards OER were motivated by um, collaboration opportunities, not so much, but also time cost saving. This is what we also know from other research. Um, uh, social altruistic factors um, are also a very important attitudinal factor. And I think we need to um, recognize this when we, are, um, 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 when we are crafting policies in institution. Um, and then of course, also the question for individual benefit. 
Um, the perceptions of quality on OER and the expectations um, show that um, quality is an important issue um, and always has. Also other research is showing that um, um, almost a bit more than half to two thirds, uh, depending on who you ask, the leaders or the professional educators, um, wish for trustworthy sources um, of uh, OER um, supply, so to speak, or access. Um, uh, personal recommendations, as I said, this um, inter-institutional and specifically the inner institutional um, um, networks are important, personal recommendations. Um, official certifications do not play such a big role, at least uh, in the group which we ask. Um, and uh, personal evaluations are the factor which are also from the inherent quality problematics of resources which come without a context, uh, which are always um, um, relying on this uh, personal uh, professional evaluation of professionals. So summarizing, we are um, actually, um, I think, seeing barriers and enablers uh, in the barriers. We believe that without going into the detail of the slide now, the culture issue is often uh, neglected too much. We believe that we need to work towards more sharing cultures. Um, we need to work towards highlighting um, the benefits for businesses, and we need to work towards more community building, networking, uh, and building trusted environments like ecosystems within institutions and between institutions. So with that and some literature, I leave you. Thank you very much for sharing. I think we will be back in the community here um, uh, more often in the next years with uh, maybe also mature, more mature results. We are going to have um, our circle and community events, uh, two of them in the next month also. So stay tuned. You find on LinkedIn, I think the links were shared uh, earlier. You find also uh, the LinkedIn groups. Uh, and with that, I think my time is over. Thank you very much from Katarina and me and the contact details are here. Um, and I yeah, think we have some time for questions and of course are open to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, so I think this has been the most incredible session and I think we have a lot to discuss. We have 20 minutes available. Um, a number of sort of themes have come up. I'm just gonna briefly go through uh, some of the, the presentations and then try and draw on some questions that I think perhaps we could, we could discuss. And I, I can't cover everything because we don't have enough time and it has been just so interesting. So we started off um, with representatives from the University of Lille, uh, Perrine, um, and her colleague, Rumold, who talked about their francophone um, OE Global that they had, like a mini OE Global in November in 2020, uh, which was used if extremely successfully to build a community, raise awareness, um, and, and build on communities that existed, but also trying to get into new communities. Um, and a range of, of contributors from the Ivory Coast, Tunisia, et cetera, French speaking um, African countries and other French speaking countries. And Rumold showed us um, his fantastic abilities around being a specialist in marketing and communities. And it's just one of the conversations I've had recently is, is around expertise that might not be within our realm, like that kind of marketing um, and, and how fantastic it is to have somebody like that to draw in to help you with areas that we're not good at. And I must say the marketing and advocacy side, I, I see that conversation coming through in all our presentations, that this is something important, that this is the, the time now to really be doing this, this kind of ad, advocacy work. And we're not all that skilled at it, but I think we're becoming more skilled if I listen to what's being done um, in these projects. So um, yeah, in the future, I'm sure we're going to hear more from, from that Francophone um, community uh, with lots of new projects coming up. 
Uh, then we had um, Orna and um, Julianne uh, talking about trying to build communities um, in the Encore Plus um, um, area. And they have built, which I really loved, their ecosystem model. Um, and, and that's a theme that I've found out of all the presentations, these incredible models that we can actually draw on in our own work. Um, and the experiences from their uh, project around um, What's, what, what worked and what didn't work is also very useful. Um, and one of the things that, well, a few of the things that, that Orna mentioned, for example, that altruistic is not enough and that we need to really think very carefully about what are the problems we are trying to solve? It's not just good enough that it's, it's a good thing to be open, but what are the specifics that we need to, to address? And that might help increase participation um yeah and and also the start of this conversation which is is, a, is also a theme about reaching new people so um Orna mentioned being you know outside of the bubble outside of of the already converted um as all said about the survey had people that were already using open education already aware of it how do we get outside of of that bubble um and, and this idea of, of this kind of echo chamber where we're, we're talking to ourselves. And, and then a great example of, of using LinkedIn um, as a way of kind of extending into an area that's, that's not only the educational area, but that's actually also a business area. Um, then um, the combination show from Caroline and, and Leo and Javiera, um, incredibly interesting critical pedagogical approach and deep thinking approach to, to open data, data agency, data justice, um, and using critical pedagogy and, and creating an, an in, that incredible um, model that they had with so many deeply thought through components around data. And this is something that we know is, is part of our conversations in, in all universities at the moment um, throughout the world is, is just how to empower ourselves so that we know what we're doing with data and that we not don't just become the object and at this point my dog wants to leave the room sorry i'm sorry um and yeah so the the, the sort of very valuable comprehensive framework that they've come up with um that that is critical at this point around data um, and then we moved on to Rob um, and this very valuable resource for, for PhD students, but for all of us to be able to use when we're supervising students in our different contexts. Um, so that's been amazing, this combination and this incredible ability that, that Goji in have managed to keep the community growing. I mean, it's a shining example of, of a community where even though I'm alumni of many years, I still really feel part of the community. And there's always these opportunities to keep working in the community. And, and certainly the, the sense of purpose around projects, around um, reviewing, around writing has been incredible um, that, they've, that the GoGen community have managed to keep this going. Um, and, then, and then on to Ulf. Um, and, this uh, project that that has been created here, and, and as he said, in, in the really in the in the early stages, um, and this discussion that he started around at his institution and an institutional culture, something that's come up a lot, is that we that people are sharing, but mm, if you tell them actually you have to share, then it's like no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And certainly in my institution, the sort of policy mandate it's just we're just not going to do that because it won't work people will deliberately say no I won't share but this kind of sharing is happening informally and and all your your concept of these kind of degrees of openness um, is something and that in the future we will have more formal open and informal open and we need to find ways of of merging those um I don't I had some love Points. Okay, then the, my last points, then I'm going to keep quiet and hand over to you. Uh, so I was, I was so interested about the idea of that we, we really need to get business um, to be thinking about open. And I'm wondering why that is a focus now. Is that because we are becoming more business-like with the unbundling of, of higher education and of services? 
and and for me you know where I always feel kind of desperate that I would like to reach communities actually and NGOs and and people with real need I'm not sure if business like us very much because we're trying to give things away for free <clears throat> I think it was Anna commented and perhaps Anna would like to speak again a little bit about her experience of working with corporate um, so I thought that would be something to, to talk about um, and, and the question of working outside the bubble, but where do we want to work outside of the bundle? Okay, that's, that's, that's me. Um, who would like to start? Um, hands up, you can unmute and, and ask a question. Questions in the chat, who would like to begin? Rob, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, just picking up on this idea of um, relationships with the private sector and business and one of the we're thinking about this in the Encore project and um, one of the things one of the approaches I've been looking at is uh, you can classify business models um, as defenders or prospectors where defenders are interested in protecting their market share prospectors are more interested in new markets and new opportunities and I think the proposition of OER is perceived more as a threat by the defenders. They've already got a market share and it's seen as more of an opportunity by prospectors, which is more entrepreneurial, um, more agile, more fluid, that kind of thing. So I think we may be a little bit guilty of painting all businesses with one brush. And there's just this thing called business. And we probably wouldn't like it if businesses did that to us. Right. And said, so oh, they're just educators are all like this. So I think it's partly just having a better understanding about what kind of things people are interested in, how they perceive it. But I definitely think we need to be careful around this idea of competitive advantage and have a quite a nuanced proposition around that so that we're not seen as a threat and we're seen more as an opportunity. Thanks, Rob, that's great. Any other comments? Um, Anna, I don't really want to pick on you too much, but I know you had quite a bit to say. Yeah, <laughs> great. There's your hand up. <laughs> Excellent. Thank well, you. Uh, I, <coughs> I just want to basically ag agree with uh, Rob. The, the, um, the hard thing is actually to, to express and to describe and to convince them about the opportunities uh, of the OER and the advantages of all general the open um, the open software general the, the openness uh, community it's a different state of mind it's a cultural issue it's what they do believe they do believe that open is not something since it's free it's open it's fully accessible should be good enough <laughs> for them it's a it's quite an anachronistic uh, belief but uh, i think it's it's still there. <laughs> I don't know how can we uh, slowly change that, but uh, as the open movement goes on more and more, we will definitely see some uh, good examples in corporate environment, but I think it will take some time, some more time. That's uh, oh my my experience was really really negative. Uh, I, I was working for a corporate environment. It was uh, proprietary software driven. I was using open source software, and I've been always accused for <laughs> any problem and mistake might ever happen in our documents, in a cert files, so or whatever. Um, I think it's a. Uh, it's difficult. They're used to think like that. So until we have some young entrepreneurs going on and use and have actual examples to show, it will be hard to convince them. That's, that's all for me. Thank you. OK. Um, Ulf, I think you were next. You have your hand up. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. I think you have really valid points there. You know, I just wanted to, to, to let you know something from a totally different perspective. And we had an incredible research voyage in the last four years. 
because we were going into the corporate sector, also into um, public institutions, by the way, not just into the corporate sector. And we were asking the people, um, the professionals and also the managers there, what do you believe are the future skills people need in order to uh, sustain, so to speak, their lives, their happiness, and also the, the innovation which you think is needed for your company or your organization? And, and how, 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 do they, how do you see people working in the future? And then we, we had discussions and interviews and so on. And at one point after listing future skills, yeah, after discussing the future skills, which they believed which are necessary, the discussion always turned to the question, how do our institutions need to change in order to um, enable this kind of future skills, because these future skills of self-organization, self-reflection, self-learning, and so on, this cannot be done in a totally closed environment, hierarchical, and not networked, for example, and so on. So, so this was an interesting discussion, because they always said uh, some things like, you know, we believe that our institutions also need to change totally because we want this autonomous, self-directed um, employees and, and staff, and we want to support them. It's about values. It's about, you know, um, having them convinced. It's about um, um, uh, more than just, you know, uh, working here. It's, it's, it's like supporting us. So, so, and then we started to think, wow, um, but if you want these kind of organizations and this kind of employers, uh, employees, uh, you, how, how do you support them? And then they said a, a third thing, which was very interesting. And they said, yeah, you know, we are totally moving away from traditional training patterns and catalog oriented trainings and so on. And we ask, but what do you do? You, what, but what do you do, do then? And they said, what, yeah, what we, they, they said, we, what we do now actually is much more supporting their individual needs and having them, so to speak, cho choosing their own uh, individual training patterns, training pathways, and so on. And we started then to think about that probably in the future, in, in a future organization, uh, a future corporate organization, um, uh, it will not be possible without um, free resources which cater for the individual and not for the for 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 some kind of uh, as a manager I buy something for everybody, but which caters from individual um, training need and skilling need and so on. Without free resources, probably there will there, it, this will not be possible. And that's our, so to speak, our rationale why we think that the corporate sector in the future will have to uh, come back to that if they want to build flexible, human-centered organizations, which they need. Otherwise, the employees are running away. That's that. That was our, um, so to speak, uh, rationale behind this. Thanks. It was a long story. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Okay, I've got um, Josh, uh, Josh Holtman next. Um, I think a lot of this is tied up with the fact that academia education at its best is a gift culture, a service culture, where people are valued by their contributions. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, management in universities is moving towards a commercial culture where it depends on how much is brought in. I, I see there's someone who disagrees. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that's what OER captures, that we are collaborating together. You give me a gift, I give you a gift. We work together. Well, it's not, yeah. Are you finished, Josh? Yeah. OK. Um, okay, I think, yeah, Caroline, I think you were next. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just, I wonder what, what Josh said, I think it's brilliant, um, it's true, but I, I wonder, I mean, hearing um, Ulf talking um, about the skilling and the training, and I wonder, you know, is it um, a different world if we are um, 
let's say, educating undergraduates to be th critical thinkers, to problematize reality, to go beyond what is obvious, to challenge common sense, um, to really go against the grain, which entails completely different things and skills and mindset than if we are training someone in a, in a corporation to either reinvent themselves, learn a skill. It depends what it is, right? So I wonder... Um, if we're thinking about these worlds as one world of education, or are we still thinking there is a different um, mindset if we are educating undergraduates to become, let's say, future teachers, or, you know, you name the profession, and if we are training someone in, let's say, IBM that is needing a personal training because he needs to. So that, that is kind of what I, I was thinking about. And I love the scenarios. I think it's really great what you presented there, this, these provocations. They're very, you know, they make you think quite. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other hands up? I think I've got some old hands. Ulf, did you want to add to that or is that not nothing new? Any other questions coming up? No, Any sorry, other? that's actually, that's this new feature in Zoom. Do you know that this new feature, they, the, the, if, you, if you make a gesture, <laughs> yes. it's recognizing the gesture as you want to put up your hand. It's terrible. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so you had to undo that actually manually. You couldn't undo your hand, you wouldn't make it go away. <laughs> Not clever enough for that yet. <laughs> I'm sure it's only a matter of time. Um, there's a comment from Derek. Derek, would you like to um, kind of have the last say? Or am I putting you I prefer on not. I, I prefer not, go. Glenda. I'm actually trying oh, yeah. to just express my my thinking in words. But if I if okay. I in in text, but if I put it in words, I'll sound even more garbled. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's great. Oh, I think there's some really useful comments in the chat as well. Um, and right, it's, we've come to the end of our time. I think this was a fascinating discussion, um, real, I think, deep, profound thinking about the role of open education, where we are, um, a great critical approach to projects um, and building communities. And it's been a pleasure to facilitate that. And thank you so much to all the presenters for stunning presentations, like the most amazing graphics. Uh, Caroline um, and Co, I loved your little logos in the green and yeah, beautiful, really beautifully done and yeah, just excellent quality presentations. Thank you very much, everyone. And yes, enjoy the last bit of the conference um, this afternoon and this evening. And I really hope that I can meet some of you in person next year in France. Um, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. So from me and from Jan, if he's still here. Um, thank you. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, friends and family. And <laughs> thank you, Glenda, for sharing. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Yes. Pleasure. Great. Thank you.